In this episode, we're making a custom controller for your desktop CNC. It's sexy, functional, and easy to build. Stick around for the details. If you're like me, you have a few desktop CNCs. Some are better than others, but most all of them require a PC to make them work. Whether you use a central PC and have wires running all over your shop or you dedicate one for each, it becomes awkward to control them all and sometimes just feels like a cheap shortcut to use a computer and a mouse to control a machine. I know, and before you mention it, there are lots of options. You can go get a cheap Bluetooth keypad or an Xbox controller, even make a custom CNC pendant using a Stream Deck. Believe me, I've tried them all and they've left me wanting more. In this video, we're making a custom controller that will work with just about any desktop CNC. It'll be set up as a human input device, which basically means it'll act like a keyboard and send hotkeys to the software you use to control your CNC. Now that's been done a few times already, but not quite like this. We're gonna put the DIY engineering spin on it and give it a classic retro look and feel, so let's get started. To do that, let's define the requirements for this thing. First, it's gotta be compact. There's not a lot of space around these machines. Next, I want it to have a rotary pulse encoder or hand wheel. It's got to have access and step selections, an e-stop, a few macro buttons, and a way to zero out your work coordinates. It'd also be nice to have a display on it, an arm disarm button on it to make sure it doesn't do things when it shouldn't. With that, I started researching the interface components. I went on a search for components that will function as well as they look. And knowing my style, I'm going to give it that sleek, retro, pragmatic look that I'm known for. Looking at the e-stop switches, I found a few stylish designs, but in the end felt that this miniature red aluminum switch looks like a good place to start. To arm and disarm the controller, I went with a standard latching ring switch, going with a black aluminum finish this time to complement that blackout interface that I love so much. For the rotary encoder, I'm going to use a 100 pulse per rotation hand switch, in black of course. Next I chose a couple six-way switches for the access and step rotary selectors. They also come with a black aluminum knob. And for all the remaining buttons, I'm going with some mini momentary switches. They remind me of arcade buttons, which I think will go good with the style I have in mind. Lastly, I have an SH1106 OLED display. I believe it's a 0.94 inch width that we can use for the display on the device. The display is gonna show you the current selections and button states as a quick reference while you're using the device. With the parts selected, the first thing I do is try to find 3D models for those components. I was able to find a couple of the components on GrabCAD, and the rest were modeled in Fusion 360. The reason I care about the component 3D models is because modeling the actual components helps me get a good sense of what the final product will actually look like inside Fusion 360 before I spend time and money to make it. It also helps to inspire me to finish projects when I can see the virtual results before it's been made. I'm always sure to set all the accurate materials and appearances on the components as much as possible. A little extra work to prevent a lot of wasted work. But design to your own level of comfort. I'm just a little picky like that. Once all the components are modeled, I place them on a shared plane and then refine their positions into a layout that works. For me. Thinking through my process, it would be most efficient to use my left hand on a wheel while selecting the axis steps and macros with my right hand. With that scenario in mind, I place the e-stop and arm button to the left side out of the way and then place the display in the middle for good visibility. At this point, I'm not entirely sure of the full functionality of the data that'll be on the screen, so I'm considering lots of different things as I work through the design. At a minimum, it'll display selected axis, steps, button states. Maybe that's all we want, uh, but you have to wait and see what I come up with. With the layout in place, I give the interface a shape that complements its form. I'm expecting the interface to have the same stack up as my Arcader handhelds, the smoked acrylic, black adhesive vinyl bezel, and a rear mounted display. With that, I build the enclosure for the design. I decided to do a split half wood, half resin design in this case. The determining factor on the wood height of one inches is simply because that's the easiest to source at that thickness. Beyond that, it just gets expensive. After modeling the body top out of wood, next I work on the base. This part has some design flexibility once it clears all button heights. I close it up, then draft the base to give it an ergonomic working angle. After adding a few fillets to smooth the body edges, things are looking nice. The last piece I'll need to address is the shape and location of the circuit board. 
With the board shape mocked out, I add mounts, then save the board outline as a DXF to be used in Altium Designer when we design the circuit board. After giving the design a once-over review, we're at a good place to start with the electronics. This thing's looking awesome, but looking awesome is only part of the solution. Designing awesome electronics is equally important, and Altium Designer makes that part easy. Before I get too into that, this video is sponsored by Altium. If you haven't taken a chance to download the free copy and see what you're missing, I've put links to the description and with Altium Designer creating these products is a piece of cake. It's fast, accurate, and fun to use. The efficient workspace has some of the best features in the industry and through all phases of your development you'll be empowered to do your best work as you grow into the more advanced capabilities. The link below will allow you a free trial version of the software so you can check it out and see what Enterprise Class ECAD feels like. Now back to the project. In Altium Designer, I create a new project, then add a schematic and board file. In the schematic, to keep things simple, I'll be using an Atmega 32U4 processor, an Arduino chip. The 32U4 chip is known to support native USB capability. It basically allows it to act like a human input device, which is perfect for this job. And to save time, I'll be leveraging an off-the-shelf board, the Arduino Pro Micro. To get the footprint in Altium, I imported a library found online that has the component footprint to make things easier. Aside from the processor, I add several headers, then two resistor ladders. This will reduce the number of GPIO pins required for the rotary switch inputs on the Arduino. The resistor ladders basically act as a six-step voltage divider. This means that the rotary switches will only need a single analog I.O. pin, instead of one for each of the six options. The display connector will leverage the I2C pins, and the rest of the buttons are connected to digital I.O., as well as power and ground. The schematic is then automatically annotated, Changes are validated, and an ECO pushes the updates to the PCB file. On the PCB, the DXF board outline was imported as primitives. These primitives are then used to define the custom board shape. With that, we're off to the races. The components are then placed in locations that have sufficient room for the headers, then the board's routed. While auto routing is great, it won't move components. In this case, it helped me understand how I could improve the layout in areas of the resistor ladders. Then after updating the component positions and orientations, I reran the auto router for a better design. A design rules check is performed on the board and the final labels and graphics are added. With that, the fabrication files are generated from the PCB. Once that's complete, they're exported as Gerber files. These are the files that the manufacturer uses to produce the boards. And for that, I'm using my go-to house, JLC PCB. They're fast, affordable, and accurate. To do that, I head over to jlcpcb.com. You drag and drop your Gerber file on the order form. It's uploaded and a preview is rendered. For the most part, the defaults are a good start. You just need to select the quantity, color, finish, and then we're good to go. For me, I usually add a solder paste stencil to save time on the SMD parts. Finally, I submit the order for processing and that's gonna take about a week. In the meantime, I'll finish up the other parts. So. Back in Fusion 360, I head over to the manufacturer workspace to create the tool paths on the wood body part. First, isolate the part, then create a setup, defining the stock size with a small piece of one inch red oak. Then we add a couple operations. First, I create a 2D pocket operation to mill out the ledge that the acrylic sits in. Using a quarter inch two flute diamond coated down cut end mill by Harvey Tools, it'll leave a clean edge on the surface to ensure that the interface looks great. Since I'll be using Neato tape to hold the work down, we're running it a little derated at 40 inches per minute and a 0.1 inch depth of cut. The next and final step is to run a contour operation on the part using the same bit, speed, and step down. This was post-processed, then sent over to CNC.js to run on the Evo 1 CNC using Neato tape. The cut was super clean, and the only real issue I had during the run was that the end mill extended further out than necessary, meaning it caused some deflection pushing through the hardwood. In practice, I backed off on the feeds a little to mitigate the noise and chatter. When finished, the part was clean. I hit it with a sanding block to break the edges on the part, and it was good to go. Next up was the body base. This was planned to be a black resin on the Forum 3, but due to the size, I decided to print it on the Piopoli Phenom. The Phenom's great for oversized parts, but unfortunately I don't have any black resin, but I'll deal with that later. To prepare the model for slicing, I pull it into a new software package, the Lychee Slicer Pro. If you haven't used it before, I'll put a link in the description below that you should check it out. I just discovered this software recently and I like it a lot so far. Plus it supports the 3D Connection Space Mouse, so working with the model is easy peasy. Lychee supports many resin printers and even includes official profiles to ensure you get good results. But this time around, we're laying the model on the build plate. No supports. Usually that's a risk. I expect this to be fine though because the undercuts are minimal, smooth, and gradual, making it a good candidate. Plus the trade-off is an easy model to clean up. No supports, divots, or post-processing. 
With that, the print simulator is a neat feature as well, and the scale reference model is surprisingly helpful. That said, I save it to a thumbnail and print it out on the Phenom. The total print time was around 6 hours, and although the print looks great, after curing in a UV chamber, I painted it matte black to match the original design. Looking good. Next up was the acrylic face. I exported the sketch from Fusion 360, brought it into Lightburn where I added interface labels to finish it off. The design was then sent over to the laser to engrave and cut the part from smoke gray cast acrylic. Next up is obviously going to be the bezel. Like my other designs, this will black out the screen but allow for the display to show through. It's set up in Lightburn and cut from adhesive vinyl. The last part is this small bracket that leverages two buttonholes to mount and align the OLED display at the correct position inside the enclosure. So, in this case, no subassembly required. It was printed on the Form 3 and took about 20 minutes. Now we're good to go. With all the parts in hand, it's time to assemble this thing. Well, at least as much as we can without the circuit boards. First we apply the vinyl bezel to the rear side of the acrylic face. Next it's just a matter of mounting the buttons into their respective holes. The e-stop arm, disarm, the hand wheel, the selectors, the display, and finally the remaining macro buttons. With all the buttons mounted, an acrylic face is mounted into the wood body using some star bond medium glue. Finally, the wood body is mounted into the resin base. This completes the assembly. Sweet. Now, next week when I receive the boards, we'll get those assembled and go over the programming of the Arduino chip to add all that cool logic and finish this thing off. So what do you think? Even though this is a pretty basic CNC controller, it's a lot of fun to pull together. In the next video, I'll be making a custom touch probe to complement this nice interface. So be sure to come back for that. That's going to do it for this video. If you're new here, hit the subscribe button and ring that notification bell. It'll help keep you notified for when new videos come out. And if you like this particular video, give it a thumbs up. It lets me know you care. I appreciate it very much. Thanks. Hey, starting next week, I'm going to try showcasing other people's projects. If you want feedback on something you're working on or you just want to share it with the community, send a photograph or link to a video and you may get shared on the channel. That's pretty cool, so send them over. Anyway, thanks for watching, and in the meantime, be safe, have fun, and I'll see you next time. Hey, if you like the video, please subscribe to the channel. It's how we're building the community. Also, allow me to bring better content. Also, check me out on these other social networks. There's lots of cool stuff there, too. Are they gone? Yeah? I'm sure they left a while ago. But not you. You watched the whole video. You're okay in my book. If you send me an email at admin at DIY engineering, I'll send you out a free sticker and magnet. So that's cool, right? Cool. See you next time.